Thank you so much, and I hope there's nobody in the room that I gave a D or an F to, right? I do recognize a lot of former students out there. He did extremely well on his thesis. It is now the landmark thesis in local area network technology, right? I should reintroduce myself by, for those of you that are trying to figure out where the heck you know me from, I actually came to this place in 1972 as a systems programmer three. We actually had ranks, and I was brought in as a programmer three, largely because the University of Calgary was foolish enough to buy a control data 6600. Anybody remember that thing? Big old supercomputer, 11 people in the world knew how to program it, right? So uh, they had to import me from New York City. Luckily, around 1976, uh, the computer science department needed help desperately, so I went up there and taught for a while. Around 1993, and this is a true story, the fellow who ran all the computer courses in continuing had dropped dead at the age of 35. And I was a little bit bummed because I was making all my side income teaching COBOL and BAL and Fortran at night. So I offered to go do his job as well as my own and wound up as the dean of continuing ed for 10 years. And now I've landed in the Faculty of Environmental Design and Ken is uh, kind enough to keep me along and I do a lot of media work. So I try to remember what I was talking about on CBC about drones there and I think what I was saying at that very point was, and with these new drones, somebody could fly over your house and they could pick up all your Wi-Fi signals or they could fly over your neighbor's nudist barbecue or down to the school to see if the kids are smoking pot behind the school. So somehow I managed to get that all out there. So I wore the same tie just to kind of match it all up. This is kind of what started it all. Does anybody have the faintest idea what that thing is? You can only see it in the Computer History Museum down in Mountain View, California. It is the Kurzweil reading machine. Raymond Kurzweil, you know, great visionary, genius, the guy behind the singularity and all that, invented in the 1980s a machine that was that, and you could lay things on top of it and it would read to you. And I was doing a little reporting in New York for CBC, and I got myself assigned to go and see this machine and its keeper. It was at the New York Public Library, so you can visualize, you all seen the public library, it's got the two lions, one is named Patience, one is named Fortitude. I had a tape recorder that weighed about 90 pounds, I had to drag it up those steps, and I got inside, and sure enough, I found the curator, and he described how the machine worked, and I had typed on a piece of paper for CBC Radio, this is Tom Keenan in New York, and it read for CBC Radio, this is Tom Keenan in New York, and I thought that was pretty cool, but when I interviewed him, I said, I gotta you know, get something different, something lively. So I said, so what do people bring to read on this? And he said, pornography. <laughs> I said, did I hear you right? He said, well, of course. If somebody wants to know about the history of the American Civil War, there are sighted readers who will go out there and will read that to them. They want to you know, see the story of, oh, Lady Chatterley's lover come to life in their minds. So I have a line in the book, which I hope you'll all buy, that that image of tumescent men, you might have to look that word up, sitting in the New York Public Library, and that voice, which is now the voice of Anonymous, right, the, the computer voice, stuck with me. It also taught me that every technology has unintended consequences. Raymond Kurzweil, I don't think, I've never had a chance to ask, wasn't thinking about people bringing porn into the library. He just wanted to enable the blind. The other thing that started all this was the media calling me all the time about weird, creepy stuff. So they call me around this thing. Now, hopefully nobody in the room has it on their phone, but girls around me have some very interesting characteristics. I'll tell you how it works. You walk into a bar, you punch on Foursquare, and particularly the younger generation, a little younger than most in this room, will check in everywhere they go on Foursquare because they want their friends to know where they are so they can meet up and all that. What girls around me did is it took people who were on Foursquare in a given area and it linked to their Facebook profiles. So all of a sudden you're this kind of creepy guy in a bar and you go, oh, she's kind of nice. Uh, let's see, oh, she's not in a relationship. And her favorite band is the Bare Naked Ladies. And you're walking over to her, getting ready to hit on this random woman. Now, girls around me was banished pretty quickly. What happened for the techies in the room, they needed a data feed from Foursquare and Foursquare cut off their data feed. This has spawned gays around me and about 1,400 other kinds of things like this. The most recent one is actually a set of city guides that not only shows you different bars, but in real time looks through cameras at those bars to see if there are women there and better yet if they are smiling. 
are they happy women? So you don't just find bars with a lot of women, bars with happy women. Why is this thing creepy? It brings together things that people never intended. When some poor girl put her Facebook profile up and poorly secured the privacy on it, and then checked it on Foursquare, she never thought those things would come together. So one of the theories that came out of this whole study of creepiness is that if we don't understand how it's working, if there are wheels turning that we don't know about, we're gonna be creeped out. Now, Bina, the Breakthrough intelligence via neural architecture, 48 exabytes, 48 exaflops. I had to put some computer science in here. That would be a real fast computer. That's right kind of on the edge of supercomputing now. Bina doesn't actually have that. In fact, what Bina has is this. Bina is a robot. She's actually an automated person who lives up in Vermont. I have some vague relation to the project because my cousin in Florida is the office manager for the person who did this. The person who uh, led this project is named Martine Rothblatt, formerly Martin Rothblatt, so she had a sex change, but she kept her spouse, who is now her lesbian lover, go figure. But anyway, she decided that she would make this creature called Bina, which carries on perfectly good conversations with people. So the New York Times sent their reporter Amy Harmon up there, and Amy was not really communicating, and then she said in her article, all of a sudden, Bina paused and turned her head and looked me in the eye and said, Amy, do you like being a reporter at the New York Times? And she said, in that one moment, I had this uncanny valley, this whole idea that, in fact, this was a human intelligence, even though I can see she's not. And then it was spoiled by the next line, if you'd like, I can tell you a story. So Bina wasn't really that intelligent. Okay, I did have some fun with this guy. Um, about 10 years ago, there was a huge trend, beer companies, Coca-Cola and all that, created things called V-reps, virtual representatives. This will probably come back again. The idea was they had so many people calling the Coca-Cola company switchboard in Atlanta with things like, hey, I wanna know, is there any cocaine in Coca-Cola? Or uh, I'm in the fourth grade and I'm doing report on the history of Coca-Cola. When was the company founded? So they decided to create this guy called Hank. And Hank would answer your questions. So we used to really torture Hank. We'd say, Hank, do you like snorting Coke? And he would say, of course. I like all the products of the Coca-Cola company. Uh, I asked him about his relationship. I said, are you gay? And he said, uh, we are not virtual representatives are not allowed to have relationships. And then a guy I know said, are you a Mormon? Which I thought was a bizarre question. But Hank came back, we are not in a position to comment on the ownership of our stock. However, we can confirm the Mormon church does not own more than 5% of it. So what's going on there is you can see the techies in the room, how the AI thing works. It's a frequently asked question data bank, and obviously Mormon was a trigger into the stockholding stuff. So Hank has now been downsized, he's a, just a pale shadow. He's a frequently asked question web page, and it says, have a question for the Coca-Cola company, drop a line to Hank, your automatic digital friend. If Hank knows how to help, he'll write back with an answer. If he doesn't know how to help, he'll let you know how disappointed he is. Now, in your pocket, you've got Siri, Cortana, all those new kinds of digital assistants. And one thing you may not have thought about is what do they know about you? So the Civil Liberties Union of Northern California actually published what Siri is keeping track of. All your friends, all the places you look for, you know, all the directions are all kind of being databased by Apple through Siri. And in fact, they also complained that Siri was actually misleading people. And because you're a computer scientist, you'll understand why. They said, people are asking for abortion clinic and getting Planned Parenthood or Save Your Baby or something like that which was Siri's best attempt. And the reason is, if you think about it, abortion clinics generally don't have that in their name. So Siri, again, is just going out there and doing a text search and finding the closest match that he can. I uh, have some friends who hack some car navigation systems, and they're very entertaining. They, uh, they went into Europe, and they found ways to get into the FM data feed that tells cars about accidents ahead. So first they started, you know, innocuous things like tunnel closed ahead. You will have to do a 600 kilometer detour. And people would dutifully do that. And then they, you know, they, they just got totally random. They would put bow fight, you know, <laughs> road closed due to bow fight and stuff like that. 
But you all probably remember, you know, the whole concept of Easter eggs. When we had computer printers here, we would frequently, you know, those big line printers, for those who remember, we would make them play music. So the fat, lazy operator would have to get off and find out why the printer is printing music. And there actually was a famous icon, only the oldest may remember. Her name was Edith. She was about 16 of those fan folded pages long. And she was a naked woman if you looked at her you know, from far enough away. She was made up of X's and dashes and asterisks. But Edith was, in fact, a naked woman. So Angus and Johan and all those operators would occasionally get rewarded with a naked woman on their printer. Eliza. Speaking of computer operators, and I should remind you, this is what computers look like, and computer operators didn't look like that. But anyway, the, um, the, you, we had to mount tape. Who remembers tapes in a room? Computer? Yeah, good, OK. Um, and Eliza was Joseph Weizenbaum's demonstration at MIT about why the human brain and the computer brain are fundamentally different. So he created this program, and he wanted to make it ape a human. And he said, well, what's the dumbest human we could ape? How about a psychotherapist, a Rogerian psychotherapist? Because after all, all they say is, how does that make you feel? And uh, tell me more about that. And oh, I see. And you know, your hour is up, that kind of thing. So Weizenbaum created Eliza. Eliza was brilliant. Actually, a lot of people said they would rather talk to Eliza than talk to a human being, including Weizenbaum's secretary. And one day he let slip. You know, I have access to all the things you're typing into Eliza. And she was totally scandalized. So that was kind of the first you know, inkling that maybe there was privacy. But what has Eliza got to do with computer tapes? Well, you know, MIT has always been known for pranks. So they didn't have enough computer operators to man all their computers. So there was a deck 20 or something there that instead of having an operator, it had no operator. So they hooked it up to Eliza, at which point somebody said, can you please mount a tape for me? And Eliza said, is it because of your mother that you want me to mount a tape for you? And history doesn't record the profanity that came from the other side, from the human side. But again, it brings out that uncanny valley, the confusion between what's human and what's not. So here's Cortana. And uh, Cortana has moved a long way from Eliza. But if you ask uh, Cortana, Microsoft's version of Siri, who created you? Cortana says, if I knew that, I'd have self-awareness, and that might be dangerous. And then, simpler question, who's your daddy? Technically speaking, that'd be Bill Gates, no big deal. So, you know, we're still playing with these things, and they are a lot of fun to torture. Okay, why do I show you that? Because that woman has far too much lust for her 3D printer. That is a 3D printer. She is far too happy that it's making her a replica of her coffee cup. Let me dispel all myths about 3D printers. Yes, they work. Yes, they can uh, make coffee cups. No, that's not an economical way to do it. To give you a little news you can use, the University of Michigan took the 17,000 things that are available and most commonly printed on 3D printers. Anybody want to guess what the most common one is? Shower ring, right? Why? Because everybody goes, oh, I bought a set of shower rings and I broke one. I will scan it you know, taking two hours of my time, I will 3D print it in the next six hours, and I'll have a new shower ring for like $96 worth of plastic, as opposed to going and buying another set. However, these people did find that there were some very high value things, anything that's custom. So if you have an orthotic in your shoe, and you need a custom made one, you can 3D print that from the podiatrist specifications, and you will in fact have one made for you that didn't cost $1,000, but cost $40 or something. So 3D printers are fun. In fact, 3D printers are a lot of fun. You can make guns. You've all probably heard of the Liberator. This is the fellow from Texas, where else, right, that decided that he would make a 3D printable gun. Is it legal? Eh, sort of. A couple of implications. There is nothing metal in that except the firing pin, which is a nail that he sells on his website for $5. You can also go to Home Depot and get it. In the United States, a gun that is totally undetectable by a, by a metal detector is illegal, so that's why it's got the nail in it. And it does violate some laws. But the other thing to think about, anybody who watches TV crime shows, how do they find the bad guy? They look at the, the marks on the bullet, on the ballistics. Well, guess what? This thing don't have any marks. And even if it did make some minuscule marks, you throw this away. Just like people have burner cell phones, these are burner guns. So it's pretty serious. And here's where it gets interesting. What do you do about it? 
Well, can you tell the 3D printer not to make a gun? No, because you're soon going to get guns that look like toy trucks and shower rings, you know, and that, it, that the printer don't know is a gun. Do you make them illegal? Well, the city of Philadelphia passed a law. It is illegal to make a 3D gun in Philadelphia. However, they didn't say anything about a gun that was made in Trenton, New Jersey, 18 miles away that you bring into Philadelphia. So it, it's always an attempt to kind of catch up with technology. I mean, what we really need is people shouldn't want things like guns and they shouldn't be making them at all. However, uh, we can have more fun. This is, I spent the whole morning getting this picture. And I, I guess I will share this story publicly. I was on sabbatical, thank you again, last year. Sabbatical is great, you get to do what you want. I said I'm gonna learn about creepy stuff. So I called the Feathered Angels Wild Waterfowl Sanctuary in Arlington, Tennessee. I said, I hear you have a duck with a 3D foot. They said, oh yeah, you mean Buttercup. You know, we'll put him on the phone. And there's, there's Buttercup. And what happened is Buttercup, little baby duckling, was born with a backwards foot. So they scanned his sister's foot and aside from the fact that he's a little girlish looking there, he's got a perfectly functional foot. And I said to my son as we were writing this thing, I said, but I must you know, be an idiot because I have, as you heard, four Ivy League degrees. You know, I think I'm very smart. And I spent the morning getting the picture of a duck, right? And you know, that's not a good use of my time. So my son said, well, maybe you can do better. So I went to this website, which I commend to all of you. It's called makerlove.com. It's a very friendly website. It, is an open source, you all know what that is, repository of adult products. What we mean by adult products, use your imagination. The things that you maybe would not want to go into a store and actually handle and pay, put down your credit card for. Instead, you can download the descriptions electronically. So I contact the guys who run this, I said, what do you got? And they said, oh, we got all kinds of good stuff. Um, we even are starting to put people's heads on our vibrator covers. And I said, like who? And they said, oh, Sigmund Freud. And they said, but, but wait, we just had a contest. And the winner for the new vibrator cover is Justin Bieber. <laughs> and I said, so his name is Tom. I said, Tom, do you seriously think that people wish to masturbate with the head of Justin Bieber? And he said, I think there's some irony at foot here. <laughs> However, 3D printers can be used for good and evil, I guess. Who remembers that thing? Okay, the Furby. This is model one of the Furby. Furby's had some interesting characteristics. This is real serious computer science. Now we're gonna disassemble code in our heads. Furby was the it toy of like the 19, late 80s, early 90s, I think. Parents actually had fights in Toys R Us. There were, they were scenes, you know, of like the box of Furby being pulled back and forth by parents because they had to have it for their kid for Christmas. The unique proposition behind Furby was that it spoke, in fact, it spoke a language called Furbish, which would be Madunio and Miomao and things like that. It had its own goofy language. But if you were nice to your Furby and you spoke to it, cuddled it, patted it, and so on, it would start to speak English. Now, the best analysis I saw of this was a guy who said, I have looked into the code on this Furby. All it cares about is that you're paying attention to it. You could read it Portuguese pornography for 36 hours nonstop, and it would still just come out with the same answer, pet me more, or whatever, that it would say if you just you know, tapped it every once in a while. However, there was a major US government agency that took a great interest in this, and it's called the NSA. The National Security Administration banned that from its premises. And I actually have in the book the memo that says, it has come to our attention that there are certain toys that are capable of learning English and recording material that may potentially compromise sensitive information. You now, before you realize how ridiculous this is, some young female programmer, got to get the female programmer thing in, did in fact disassemble Furby's language. Furby knew 200 words, 100 in Furby, 100 in English. Every Furby knew the same words. Even if they talked to each other, they, they used to talk to each other, you put two of them down, and they would go, here, kitty, kitty, and the other one would go, here, kitty, kitty, and if you had a real cat in the middle, it was chaos, right? Because it was, <laughs> Furbies are calling the cat. Also, they have no off switch. So there was a whole set of web pages called How to Kill a Furby, because <laughs> it came out that people actually thought they were malevolent beings that have been put on the earth to torture us, and the best one is, put him in the microwave for 10 minutes. You will kill a Furby. However, you will also destroy the microwave so Furby has the last laugh. Anyway, the NSA 
banned Furbies because they were afraid that somebody would have one in their office, it would record a top secret conversation, they would take it home to their kid and they would spill the, spill the beans. I've learned the book about cameras, okay, people, you know, I used to go to a computer conference, Carrie was with me one year, where we actually counted cameras in San Francisco, and the rule was, at the end of the conference, you could, after you had 100 cameras, you could go have a beer, and it took us like, what, 15, 20 minutes. Well, now there's cameras everywhere, there's big cameras, little cameras, little tiny uh, grain of wheat type cameras, and in fact, we're soon going to have cameras in grocery shelves. So what I try to do, I should tell you a little aside here, uh, what I try to do in the book is make people think about what's going to happen kind of between now and 2019. I figure by then he'll give me another sabbatical, I can write another book. And I start the book actually with the difference between the original Woodstock concert in 1969 and Woodstock 50th, which will be in 2019. And we will still have rock concerts, there's no question people will want to go there. <coughs> Even with media availability, and even if it's free, people will still want to go have that experience. But here are some things that are different. First of all, as you try to see the stage at Woodstock, you will be swatting away flying drone cameras that other people have launched to get a better view of the stage. Uh, if you forgot to renew your license when you go back to your car, it will be a smart license plate, and it will say expired instead of your license number. Uh, if you go to the medical tent, you will find, you know, Woodstock 69, it was largely uh, problems with chemicals. In 2019, we're sort of predicting it will be problems with electricity because there are enough people doing electrical stimulation of the brain, and some know what they're doing and some don't, that this thing called wireheading that I actually predicted back in 1984 may be actually the big psychedelic thing at Woodstock. And if you want to see some evidence of that, there are some forums on how to do it. And there also are consumer devices like Nekomimi, which are robotic cat ears. And they basically connect into your brain and they measure your brain waves and they detect your level of arousal. So there's a great YouTube video where this Japanese girl sees a good looking guy walk by and her ears shoot up and then he keeps going and her ears flop down again. So for $60, you can have Nekomimi. So what's this gonna be all about? Well, they're gonna put cameras in store shop, in store shelves, and they're gonna detect things like, are you male or female? Uh, what is your body mass index? And they will start trying to target you. And in fact, a lot of what I found is that people are already being targeted in retail malls all over North America. And in fact, in bars. This is a real app, it's called SceneTap, and each bar that subscribes to it, this happens to be Beantown Pub in Boston, hangs some cameras up, sends them a data feed, and in real time, you are told the ratio of males to females. So this one is not a good place for guys to go to right now. It's two-thirds guys and the average age, as well as the drink specials and so on. So one thing to note for later reference, they figured out a way to monetize this. So a lot of these apps, you know, they're interesting ideas, but how do you get money? And the answer is, well, they tell you what drinks you can buy them. So that's called scene tap. I have a good friend at Carnegie Mellon, Alessandro Acquisti, and Alessandro does these great experiments. So one of them that he did, and it's well described in the book, is he took all of the people, certain age group, on Facebook in the Pittsburgh area, and he looked at their faces, their profile pictures. Then he took all the people on a dating site called Match.com in Pittsburgh and looked at their faces. Now you have to know, for those of you that are innocent of dating sites, or God forbid Tinder or whatever, the um, <coughs> Tinder? Did anybody react to Tinder? No? Okay. You're not going to admit that, yeah. Anyway, the, the, um, the dating, people who register on dating sites do not use their real name, or very rarely do. They're always Sexy Babe 235 or Hung Guy 404 or something like that. And only when they meet someone online of interest do they divulge their real identity. Well, Alessandro took these two ba databases and mashed them together, and about one in five times with PitPat, which is very pedestrian facial recognition, he was actually able to figure out who the person was or de-anonymize them. There is a new research project at Facebook's AI lab called DeepFace, and they announced the results about three weeks ago. Human beings, if you were given some photos to match up, you'd probably be 99.7% accurate. And we always say, well, computers are like 10%, 20%, 30%. Facebook's new algorithm, 99.2%. So within a margin of error as good as a human. What does this mean? Facebook has the largest 
voluntarily contributed, self-identified facial database, except maybe the U.S. government. We're not really sure who's ahead. I do dispel in the book the myth that the Facebook was created by the U.S. government. Because I went to a senior guy in the CIA, I said, did you do this? And he said, no. But then he said, but we use it every day. And, and hey, if, if Zuckerberg hadn't done it, we would have done it, right? So, so what Alexander and his friends are suggesting, and there is actually an app now called nametag.ws. You point your cell phone at somebody, it recognizes their face. The current database is not that interesting. It's registered sex offenders in the United States. So if you're next to somebody at a bar, you can at least see if they're in that database. But it will grow, and more databases will come in. Now, sometimes we just ask for trouble. And in case you haven't heard about Please Rob Me and sites like that, so many people go on Twitter and Facebook and they're so enthusiastic to go, we're heading to the airport, we're gonna be in Hawaii for two weeks, the dog's with the dog sitter and all that. And they come back and find their house cleaned out. So the folks behind Please Rob Me just took Twitter, Facebook, and other things and presented opportunities. In one 10 minute period, Please Rob Me presented 289 opportunities of people who had checked in that they were on their way to the airport. So don't put that kind of stuff up. Speaking of dumb people, this is the guy who took a bath at work. Unfortunately, work was Burger King. And uh, he became very famous. His name is Tim. Um, I have formed a sort of conspiracy theory. Okay, does anybody remember Ellen Simonetti? Ellen was the, uh, I shouldn't do this for the camera. Ellen was the queen of the sky at Delta Airlines who posed with her blouse open. And she got fired from Delta Airlines. Well, I got to tell you two things. Ellen now has an acting career, and you don't want your kids to see her movies, OK? This guy, Timothy Tackett, went on to a career as a spokesperson. He got fired, as did everybody else in this Burger King, with good reason. I mean, that's the, the food prep and dishwashing sink that he's bathing in. But he went on, and he's now a spokesperson for an adventure travel company in the US. So sometimes, maybe these things are done with intent. This was not done with intent. Okay, for a period of time, and you have to look a little closely, Amazon has suggestions about what you might like to buy. Adult reusable cotton poly snap diaper fits 32 to 46, so that's you know Ken to me, right? I mean, basically that range there, okay? And basically, what we've got here is that being offered on Amazon, but look, frequently bought together. Customers buy this item with Call of Duty 4, Modern Warfare. You can imagine why they need those two products. <laughs> I grabbed this screen capture years ago. I went back, and now they are scrupulously aware of this vulnerability. So they just say, surprisingly, we have nothing else to suggest to you. If you go to video <laughs> games, they suggest other video games, diapers, you're on your own, basically. However, there is a point to the slide besides fun, which is Amazon is watching all that data. They have some of the most advanced big data analytics. They have some of the best AI people, and they sell that data mercilessly. In fact, people have reported that they have looked at something on Amazon, and moments later, an ad comes up on Google or Facebook or somewhere, funnily enough, for that very product. And the reason is there is a real-time market, one is called FBX, in which your likes are being sold. How does it know your likes? Because of what you typed in. There has been a bit of a privacy kerfuffle because one guy put some of his medical needs in, the fact that he needed a CPAP for sleep apnea, and all of a sudden that was coming up in Google ads, and the privacy commissioner chastised Google for that. And Google said, oh yeah, I won't do that anymore. Believe that. But anyway, um, everybody's uploading photos. Okay, the, that's an old number, 2.5 billion uploaded by Facebook users every month. It's probably that much in a week now. Most people have their real names up there. Facebook is the largest known facial database. Facial recognition is getting better. Cloud computing allows anybody who wants to to go buy a bunch of computing power. What does this mean? Well, I had an actual adventure that I thought I'd show you. This is a Microsoft ad. It happens to be from Microsoft New Zealand. The reason is New Zealand seems to be living in the 1980s. And I'll explain why. That's the punchline. This woman's name is Marla. Does anybody happen to know Marla? She did study here. Okay, so here's what happened. All through Silicon Valley, this ad was being put up in newspapers and so on alongside Linux world. Now, as you know, the woman who was the spokesperson for Microsoft would never touch Linux. And the, the pure Linux woman would never go near any of Bill Gates' stuff. 
how did this woman actually turn out to be both? And there was like in Wired.com and all that, there was all this speculation. And they even went into looking. It's a little hard to see her face here. And they said, well, she's kind of like the geek super chick because she's attractive, but not so attractive that a guy who's been eating Doritos in his mother's basement for a week, you know, he might still think to ask her out. She's, she's an approachable geek supermodel. Well, her name is Marla. And the way I found out about her is she walked up to me and she said, have you seen this? And I said, yeah. And she said, that's me. <laughs> she worked for a company in town, iWire, and iWire took photos of all their employees. They were in the stock photography business. She signed a model release. She never got a penny for her photo. And it got picked up all over the world. It was used by Hitachi. It was used by Microsoft. And they were all too um, simple-minded to buy exclusive use of it. They all bought the royalty-free use of it. So I licensed Marla's picture for my book as well, and I have her in there. Now, why do I have the Microsoft New Zealand thing? Because while every other Microsoft site in the world has gotten rid of Marla, she must have a secret admirer down there, because she is still, as of this week, on the Microsoft site, advertising some completely obsolete you know, product, Visual Studio. <laughs> Anybody been on chat roulette? Oh, dear. Chat roulette, I, I, I got caught short once because uh, Perry Aptab, who's a, a privacy lawyer, knew something I didn't know, which knowing Perry is not that, that hard to believe. But somebody said, well, where'd chat roulette come from? And I said, Russia. And she knew more. She said, no, it was a horny 16-year-old boy in Russia. And that's more or less true. There was a guy in Russia who decided that it would be really fun, now that we all have video cameras, to allow you to connect randomly to people. Now, I know you're somewhat trepidatious about what might come next. And the answer is almost nothing on chat roulette is showable in a public presentation, except maybe this. So that demonstrates the user interface. So the poor lad on the bottom is asking, WTF are you? I assume you're hip enough with computer lingo, so you guess that. And the stranger just says a cat, to which there really is no answer. So, <laughs> so that, that's one of the uh, tamer uses of chat roulette. Um, oh yeah, they, there is a bit of a link here. The chat roulette folks got such bad press that they actually hired people to go out and write nudity finding software. Okay? I don't want to say, confirm or deny that I ever gave that as an assignment in Computer Science 203, but I used to give whatever assignment I thought would get them excited. So the most popular assignments, if any of you took the course, used to be um, a computer dating service. So you could go around the class with your clipboard and collect a lot of data. Uh, and hockey pools were popular too. Well, you know, the reality is somebody created nudity finding software to try to keep the bad guys off chat roulette, and it turned rather rapidly into bada bing, which mines all the photos that are on your friend's pictures looking for as much skin as possible. So again, everything that has a bright side has a potentially dark side. Um, I thought this was the creepiest, one of the creepiest things I found. I'll show you a creepy place later. but. This is actually, and I hope none of you are into this, an online world of virtual adoptions where people pretend to adopt kids and they virtually breastfeed them and I'll let your imagination run wild. The reason I have this particular one is that that child is in Hamilton, Ontario. Her mother innocently posted a picture of her on Facebook and somebody said, hey, I saw your daughter's up for virtual adoption. And the line was, my daughter is not for sale. You know. She's not up for adoption. So that was a kind of creepy world. Now we get to the actual creepiest place on Earth, which also knows the happiest place on Earth. Who's been to Disney theme park? Come on, admit it, OK. So Disney theme parks have utilidors, corridors underneath them, where you can occasionally see Mickey Mouse and Goofy holding hands and some gay embrace or whatever. But basically, they're always down underneath, except when there's garbage. And there's a reason why there's no garbage at Disney World, because there are these people underneath who see the garbage and they run up and take it. And this has been going on for years. But Disney World just got a lot creepier because they introduced these. These are called My Magic Wristbands. And everyone wants them. Okay, why does everyone want them? Well, first of all, they're cool. So if you go, and this is actually some family posted, the whole family there. So there's Amy, and there's you know, mom and dad and Mark. And they're all going to have their wristbands. They fit even the tiniest wrist. And what do they do? Well, they track you 24-7 when you're on the park. Your every move is being surveilled by fairly high power technology based on RFID. And when Minnie Mouse is standing over there, and she sees you with your little five-year-old child coming along, 
Minnie has on her iPad, five-year-old child, name is Molly, uh, loves Snow White and uh, uh, spending limit $50. Okay, so they actually, their cast members are aware of what you're doing. And so some people are saying, well, this is creepy. I don't want to do this. You know, and it is true. You can get paper tickets. They still have paper Disney World tickets that you can use. You still have to give them your, bi your biometrics, like you have to put your fingerprint down. Even, even two-year-olds, they take their fingerprints, right, or hand geometry. However, here's where it gets interesting. I put the term de facto mandatory there. If you don't have this wristband, yes, you can come to Disney World. Yes, you can go and see the Thunder Mountain uh, roller coaster. Yes, you can stand on the three-hour line. If you have this, you get a certain number of privileges, like cutting lines. Imagine being the parent who's telling your children, oh, you know, we value our privacy, so that family can go on right away, but we're going to stand here for three hours. It's just not going to happen, right? The other thing I solved is why nobody ever farts at Disney World. And it is true. No one has ever reported smelling a fart at Disney World, any Disney theme park. And that's the answer. It is a patented technology. Disney owns the patent. It's called the Smellitzer. And the Smellitzer is a high-powered combination of smell and howitzer. It is a gun that shoots out aromas. So when you go into the Pirates of the Caribbean, uh, you're going to smell the ocean or smell a ship. Uh, when you go into the Haunted Mansion, it's going to smell musty. They have all these concocted smells there. And, you know, of course, one of them is anti-fart smell or something. So they just blow smells away. But they don't stop there. When you're walking down Main Street, USA, you're always going to smell cookies baking. Even if those cookies were baked 30 miles away, you know, a whole different facility, you're going to smell them baking because they're pumping that out there. It turns out that a whole number of other places use smell. The creepiest one are funeral homes, and the reason is dead bodies smell bad. So the next time you have the misfortune of being in a funeral home, take a whiff and you will probably smell cinnamon. They actually have the name of the cinnamon spray they use. But on a happier note, sports arenas. Most companies that use scent marketing deny it or don't comment on it. But the St. Louis Rams in the US admitted that they did an experiment where they piped the smell of cotton candy into the air. And not only did the sale of cotton candy go up, all their concession sales went up because people associated that with, hey, we better go get some food. So, you know, does the Calgary Stampede do this? Maybe, maybe not. Weirdly enough, because we have a friend from Australia in the room, two Australians were camping and they were camping in Yellowstone Park and they noticed they felt really good. And you may have noticed this too, right after you go out and finally convince yourself to mow the lawn or rake the leaves, you're on a bit of a high. There's an actual biological reason. It has to do with some hexanols and phenols that can be extracted. And these fairly smart Australians actually did, and they marketed a Serena scent. So I speculate in the book that the next time you're standing in line at the post office or the motor vehicles office, your government might even be using a little scent therapy on you. We know that certain nightclubs use it. We know that the Barclays Center in Brooklyn uses it. Probably the strangest one is the Holiday Inn. And they're pretty upfront, you know? They always put scents in your room. If it's a wedding, they put rose petals. If it's a business meeting, they put the smell of leather. So they figured that out a long time ago. And it turns out this is neurologically a channel to a very deep part of the brain that will make you do stuff. And the way we know that is Nike has been messing around with different kinds of sprays on different shoes and watching people. And they have a certain rose scent. And when they spray it on shoes, miraculously, everyone goes to those shoes. And if they're the most expensive shoes, they don't care. Those are the shoes they have to have. So one of the things that I found creepy was, you know, it ain't all just about drones and surveillance and so on. They're doing stuff to us. As a professor, I must give you homework. The homework is to go home and to Google or go on YouTube and watch the video of Dave the Incredible Mind Reader. And this is just one little snap from it, but essentially a Belgian financial institution wanted to see how people reacted to an experiment. They set up a big tent and they had people out going, we're doing the pilot for a reality television show. We have the world's best psychic. His name is Dave. He can tell you anything about yourself. So you come into this tent, sign this model release. We need your name and all that. 
and you go inside and sit down, and Dave would jump around, and he'd hug you and kiss you, and then he would start telling you your bank balance, and that you had a motorcycle that you were trying to sell, and in the case of one woman, that she enjoyed multiple sex partners, and it just went on and on like that, and eventually, a curtain would drop, and there were six black hooded ninja type hackers with the victim's Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all that accounts open. And essentially, they were researching the person in real time and talking in Dave's ear. And instead of being, in fact, in a reality TV show, these people wound up with their own consent in a commercial for the Belgian Financial Regulatory Agency. And the motto is, your life is online, you know, be careful. Definitely be careful if you go to Florida. Okay, the United States is a different country. I am both an American and a Canadian and also an Irishman. And I can tell you that they have different rules down there. One of them is that sheriffs are elected officials. So if you are Sheriff Al Ninehouse down in Florida, and you want to still be sheriff, you want to get reappointed, then what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to show you're doing your job. What better way for a sheriff to prove that he does a good job than to show who was arrested recently? And Sheriff Al does that. And they're usually not the most pleasant looking people. And one thing to remember is that these people are just arrested. They're not guilty. They haven't been tried or anything. But we know that Kathy Simmons is charged with uttering a forged instrument. And William Leo Wilbur III with contempt of court and failure to pay child support. So all this stuff gets put up there and stays up there for 30 days. And people get shamed by it. But it gets even better. I caught this particular site doing this case. I've obscured the name. I've obscured the eyes. I'll do the math for you. Young Bobby here was born in 1997 and had the misfortune to be arrested in 2010. He is 12 years and two months old. And there's his photo up on the sheriff's site. Now, this probably was a slip up. Okay? I took it to the Privacy Commission of Canada. I said, would this ever happen? He said, oh, no. We would never let that happen in Canada. But in the US, not only does this kind of stuff happen, there's a whole thriving mugshot industry. And these are people hiding behind a principle. And the principle is that if somebody's arrested, that's public information. And that's true. And Americans have a right to know that. Americans have to know about these people who are arrested. So they've got Edward Snowden, Aaron Swartz, you know, Gloria Arroyo. But the poor guy from Fort McMurray who you know, had a, some misfortune in, in Minnesota, he gets up on here. All kinds of people get up on here. You don't have to be famous to be up on the site. However, if you want to be off the site, this guy is very principled. He says, I'm doing this to foster respect for law and to bring criminals to justice. However, I have an unpublishing service for $499 that will take your photo down. And so that actually is the racket. They put your photo up there, which they got from a public source. You then pay them to take it down. It gets even better, though, because the, um, you can also do the opposite. You can pay money to have somebody's photo stay there permanently. And I couldn't get an answer from what happens if people pay in both directions. Do so they just take all the money? So how do you deal with this? OK, it's a really, really good question. And um, uh, Kashmir Hill from Forbes wrote a great piece on it that pointed out that laws really you know, are a little bit useless here. Like, you know, you, there's still a principle that these things can be up there. And you know, Oregon passed a law that said, if you were acquitted in court, they had to take your, uh, on request, they had to take your photo down, little things like that. But what's really happening is two things, and they're both technological. One of them is Google said, yeah, these people are, are, are really sleazes. I mean, some guy gets arrested, and that photo comes to the top of his Google search results when there's like 20 years of good works below it. So that's what everybody sees. So Google has actually taken their secret sauce page rank algorithm and altered it so mugshots go way, way down. So that's one thing that has kind of hurt these guys. The other thing is the payment folks. So MasterCard, you know, PayPal, all those folks are fixing, I don't know if they're going to do it, to stop allowing these people to use money. So you know, eventually they'll have people who want their pictures on publish up to use Bitcoin or something like that right, to, to, to get their pictures off. So it's an interesting twist on how something that was well-intentioned, let's post the guilty people, turned into that. I have a whole chapter on DNA. I don't have a lot of time to talk about it, but I did want to mention that if you're in New York City, you can find out who your daddy is just by going into this truck. It's a mobile DNA testing van. And uh, the guy who runs it, as you might expect, 
It is New York City has just sold the rights to a reality TV show based on this. <laughs> it's going to be called Stories, Stories of the Swamp or something like that. And uh, he's got all kinds of good yarns, and he drives that truck around, and he will do your DNA test, or you can send it in. Now, if you send it in, I do suggest use an assumed name, use your dog, use your cat, something like that. But you can get a lot of interesting stuff from your DNA. And this is that chart I was saying about where I sort of bring together the technological creatures. I know it's hard to read, but you know, some of the dimensions are, does something pretend to be human? We seem to find that creepy. Does it surprise us? Is it within our control? Does it have a high impact on it? Is it mysterious? Uh, reputation. Girls around me went downhill really rapidly once the New York Times said, this is like, this takes creepy to a new level. Whereas if you think about it, Facebook is very innocuous. Like, it's kind of a neutral name. You know, it's not really bad or anything. So guys up at MIT have a very interesting technology to see people on the other side of a wall through radio frequency. Pretty hot stuff. In their video, they call it, and I'm sure they had help from the MIT PR people, connect of the future. So connect is the thing that tracks your movements for Xbox. They're suggesting this is how you will play video games. In my book, I said that's you know one name. Another thing you could call it is the Anne Frank Finder, you know the thing that finds people hidden behind walls. And depending on which one of those names you give it, people will have a totally different reaction. But in fact, that technology is much more likely to be used to find people. And I have in the book the Massachusetts photograph of. Uh, the, one of the Boston Marathon bombers who was found under the tarp in the boat. And he was found by basically uh, infrared cameras. Some advice before we have some questions. Don't assume anybody is your friend, even your Facebook friends, uh, the person who was stranded somewhere. You all know that already. The invasion of privacy you know, really begs the question whether we have any. I came to the conclusion that we have very little. I'll tell you one little story. Um, young lady near Minneapolis, gets some mail, and her dad opens it. It's an ad from Target, and it's for baby things. Now, you have to know economically, baby, when somebody has their first baby, they are great consumers. They buy baby carriages. They buy diapers. They buy all baby oil, all kinds of stuff. So Target really wants them. <clears throat> they were tracking, and this girl didn't even have a credit card, just with a debit card. They were tracking her, and then she signed up for some coupon or something, they had her home address, and they sent her baby stuff. So dad comes into the Target store. He says, my daughter is 16. She's in high school. Why are you, you know, you want her to have sex? And why, why are you doing this? Well, two weeks later, dad comes back and says, I got to apologize. There were some things going on in my house I didn't know about. She's due in August. And uh, Target said, oh, thank you for sharing that with us. <laughs> At which point, and here's where the real creep happens, the brains, the computer science graduates at Target said, oh, you know, She's not going to buy stuff if we creep her out. How are we going to deal with this? So they came up with a way. They still target pregnant women that they've determined are pregnant with ads for baby stuff. But they mix in barbecues and power drills, you know, and tents and stuff that they don't want. So the woman looks at it and goes, oh, everybody's getting these ads. Oh, good, an ad for a baby carriage. So the money quote that Charles Duhigg of the New York Times got was, as long as she doesn't know we're, do we're targeting her, it's not creepy. So that is in many ways the mantra, that there is stuff going on in the background that is being done to us that we don't even think about. But you know, when you get that, suddenly I got an ad, I was looking at it on the state sale, and I got an ad for chandeliers. And I just had paused on the chandelier. And all of a sudden, chandeliers.com comes up. And I go, you know, is, is Google psychic? And are they using image recognition? And all these things are possible. So then I you know, took out the image and looked, and it was chandelier.jpg. So that's how they knew, right? But you know, it can happen. Be very careful posting anything online. You can never get it back, even if it's up there for a moment. I've always told people, somebody out there is grabbing all your stuff, right? You know, whether it's somebody who grabs your Facebook post. Well, now we not only know who is one of those actors. It's the NSA. We know where they are. They're in Bluffdale, Utah. But the Communication Security Establishment of Canada does many of the same things. So the reality is, assume if it's out there that you've given it up. And my whole new thing is probably going to be about something called touch DNA. So I'd go and wash this glass if I were you. I'm told Madonna actually has a helper who cleans her DNA off every glass that she touches. Why do I say this? Well, I've just come across some research that suggests that two things. 
there's enough DNA on this last to, to sequence me genetically, and there is now a technique called genome hacking. And if you have some DNA from somebody, with high probability you can find their surname. I'm not sure if you know who Craig Venter is, pretty famous guy in the DNA sequencing world. He posted his genome online, and somebody ran this against him and got his most likely surname. So when touch DNA and genome hacking comes together, I'm predicting we'll go to Target or some store, the Bay, we'll use that little pin pad, and just like those toilet seat covers that you, know, you get a fresh one, the pin pad will go away, and they're methodically processing your DNA, and the next time you come in, they go, you know, hey, you're a diabetic, or you're prone to diabetes, don't you want this? And just target us based on that. Okay, the moral of all this is be nice. So I had to leave you with news you can use. There's a site called dirtyphonebook.com. You can go onto it, you can put any 10-digit number, and you can write anything you want. Most of them are, I have to censor. Gabby is a beautiful girl, blonde hair, green eyes, full lips, and a big Julia Roberts belt. The rest of them, can't really read. Anyway, that site is still up there. Luckily, this site isn't. I hope you all recognize the outline of downtown Calgary. This site was called RottenNeighbor.com. And for a small, not very glorious period of time, you could write any address and anything you wanted to about anybody. Now, you'll notice that the reds are rotten neighbors. My house is around here, but I'm not a rotten neighbor. There's one uh, green. Anybody know what that is? So we got um, Cloud Trail. We got the river. Calgary Flames. Okay, that's the Stampede Grounds. And they said the Calgary Flames were a good neighbor. Uh, but you got foreclosures. You got sex offenders. You got all that stuff. This is actually what the site looked like. So one of the other principles about why this site is gone is that although it was fun and entertaining to say nasty things about your neighbors, there was no money in it. Can you see a Cisco ad or a U of C alumni ad here? I don't think so. You know, the reality is nobody wants to advertise on certain things that are too nasty. Now, if they could find a way to monetize it, I checked and they still have the site registered. My favorite decision point here, free to good home, Beautiful six-month-old male kitten, playful, friendly, affectionate, or handsome 32-year-old husband. Personable, funny, good job, does not like cats, says he goes or the cat goes. Call Jennifer, come and see both and decide which one you'd like. <laughs> Real ad, somebody ran it somewhere. I've tried that number in many area codes. I've never found Jennifer to know if she has a cat or her husband. But uh, uh, on that happy note, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Do you make Ken work and hold the microphone? <laughs> I think we've got about 15 minutes for questions. Great. And there's the first one. Yes. Yes. You mean? Yeah, the police have aging software. And it's interesting, it's kind of sad. What happens as you get older is your ears get bigger and your, a lot of things get hairier and so on. But they already have that aging technology. So yeah, they're definitely using that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, facial recognition, I maybe, you know, I know I played it up here, but I probably underplayed it. It's probably going to be like automatic that you know, people will walk down the street with Google Glass and they'll look at you and they'll go, oh, Charlie, how's your uh, seven-year-old daughter, Melinda? You know, and that kind of stuff. So it's, it's going to totally destroy honest social interaction. Next question. More. Yes. Now the class is on. Right. And so I never have them off in the airport. So how's the facial recognition software going to pick me up when I don't look the same as my picture? They actually, uh, uh, <laughs> there's a company working with the U.S. military that rotates your head in 3D. It does false 3D. It looks around corners like that. Already, it isn't well known. The insurance company of British Columbia already uses facial geometry. So if you have a BC driver's license and you go there and you try to get another one, your face will, will come up as a ringer if you're already in their database. So that, that technology is getting pretty good. So the glasses were an impediment for a while, but uh, I think they're beyond the glasses, mainly by the three-dimensional aspect. Somebody in the back, come on, wake up there, yes. Yeah, a couple of months ago, uh, uh, yeah, 
<laughs> yep, months ago I I got an email from my daughter. Hey, uh, Dad, better take that thing off your Facebook. I said, what thing? And she said, oh, that you were reading this article. Reading what? what? An article in the newspaper. Yes. And it said John recommends this article, uh-huh. and I didn't recommend it. And she said, "Oh, you probably had your Facebook open when you were reading the newspaper article." There, there was so how period, did they do that? There was a period when Facebook was actually tying people together uh, from other windows that were open, and they got spanked for that. I think they had to pay five hundred thousand dollars. So it's too bad you don't live in California. You, if you were used in a sponsored story by them, they actually incurred some some liability. Uh, I want to tell you how Facebook fixed that. They changed their privacy policy the next week so that they're no longer violating it. <laughs> Andrew. Hello. Um, I read a study uh, a couple of years ago. The value of privacy. And they said everyone's outraged when, you know, there's creepiness when people are, are violating their privacy. But if you offer a website that says, I will send you various stuff, and they settled on the average, which was a set of steak knives, to have to register all of their private information. The private, the private information seems to have a value only of a set of steak knives. Mm-hmm. How, how outraged are people getting about this? How, how real is, is this outrage? Well, many of you, I'm sure, won't ask who has a Safeway card, and I have a Safeway card, and it has an address, Post Office Box 42, Plong Luang, Bangkok, Thailand. So I don't know if they send me an email. What people are doing is, in fact, they are complying but giving false information. They're making up a dozen different email addresses. I checked with the police. It would be illegal for me to impersonate Ken, God forbid. But it would not be illegal for me to make up a virtual Ken that had nothing to do with Ken and impersonate that person. You can actually go out there and create as many false personas as you want. So I give you about 15 tips in the book to throw people off your digital scent, some of which are pretty sneaky, like making up fake names and you know, doing things and, and lying in those surveys. Like I can tell you, if you want to get, sometimes you get like you know, free points or something for taking surveys. Well, if you're my age, they're not interested in your opinion. So I shaved 20 years off my age and now they want my opinion all the time. Finally, just this week, Air Miles caught me and they said, you're not eligible for this survey due to inconsistencies. <laughs> Whoa! So it's time for a new Air Miles card. <laughs> yes. Do you think that uh, these technological changes are going to start pushing cultural change? I mean, I know a lot of friends who are in politics, and some of them have finally said, you know what, I'm going to keep my, my profile on this dating website or this fetish website or this. And, and have their photos up there, and I'm aghast that nobody's been caught, and there haven't been any sort Anthony of Anthony Weiner, yeah, yeah, that nothing's that nothing's happened yet, and and yet some people are saying, you know what, I'm I'm taking a stand and saying that my personal life is my personal life. If you're interested in that, that's your problem, not my problem. Do you think that there's going to be a change in the future where people won't care what people know about their private life? Mm, Bill Clinton kind of got away with it, but no, by and large, that's all coming out, and I mean it's. Uh, uh, your, your entire life is public, and the more you're in politics, the more you have to be squeaky clean. There are consultants who just go through people's files, you know, saying, beg rid of that, beg rid of that. Uh, there's a case going on in Calgary where a prominent young lad who might be a hockey player star someday is desperate to erase all the bad stuff he put out there. Okay? So I told him that if he can get enough in an advance from the NHL, I'll do it for him. <laughs> Yeah, uh, thank you very much for your lecture. Um, I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit to some of the legalities around some of these issues. Uh, it seems to me that uh, some of the things that uh, we uh, would like to keep maybe somewhat private would be along the lines of essential services, outside of essential services, where you're having a choice of whether you want to buy something or not buy something. Um, yep. that, that's a different game, in my opinion. It's called a government. Like, you can't, I mean, a woman is going to jail for not filling out the census. There are certain things that you have to give up, your taxes, your real estate taxation. I have a chapter called Government Creep in the book, and I'll give you a couple of examples. In Philadelphia, I went back through all of the um, political contributions, and I was able to find out some fascinating things. Anybody know who Juan Rivest is? RSA algorithm, famous MIT professor. I found out that he contributed to a candidate in Philadelphia. It's not illegal, but it's unusual. They actually went back 70 years, and they published 
all the people's contributions, because that's the law, and their addresses. But then it got even better, because when I looked at the addresses, 21% of the people with the surname Jones gave the same address. So I run to, run to Google Maps to try to see if this is like the world's largest rooming house or something. And it's the office of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. So you can see the scenario. You know, They go in to get an electrician job, and they're reminded that some political candidates are worth supporting, and you can use our address. So you, know, you discover all kinds of patterns just going through government data. So I have a whole, I gave a speech in Singapore two weeks ago on how I torture open government data to find out stuff. And a lot of people are going, oh my god, you know, like we're from the government and we thought we were helping you. But by putting that data out there, they, often you can find out things about individuals. Um, Toronto, for example, the 311 calls are all put up and they're supposed to be by the first three digits of your postal code. But they get lazy, they put, you know, Bloor and Danforth or something like that. And sometimes the intersections, they put there's only one house. So they've essentially revealed who's made the call, even though that's supposed to be confidential. So I'm not against open data. I think open data is a good thing. I just want to see it done right. When it comes to insurance companies, oh, those guys. is there a way that we can get our file from them to review what they have on us? Yeah, one, one, I'll tell you a quick story on that. I, two stories. One is a woman who was always having trouble getting a loan, and she finally got a hold of her credit report, which is not her insurance report, and she found out that it showed that she was listed as having been in small claims court. And she said, and they, and she said, yeah, that's true. I sued a guy and I won. And she insisted that the firm, which was uh, a choice point data systems, actually correct it. And they refused to. They said, is it a true fact? Terrible phrase there. Is it a true fact that you were in court that day? And she said, well, yes, but I was, and no, nope, that's what we got. Another guy was always getting interviewed for jobs as an engineer and never getting the job. So here's the answer to your question. He got his buddy, who was a headhunter, to pull his personal data file. It's actually called your public data file, ironically. And the friend said, well, you understand why you never get hired. You're a murderer. You did 10 years in jail for murder. And he said, no, I didn't. And they had crossed his social security number just enough with somebody else's that he was linked to being a murderer. So the answer is you need a sort of clandestine way to get at that file, like a headhunter or a company or something like that. Maybe ask me privately, I'll give you suggestions. One more. So is the answer You know, that's one answer. Um, some people think they should, but I'll tell you that doesn't always work. Just because you're innocent doesn't mean you, you, you definitely are innocent. I'll give you one more little story. The, uh, um, uh, my police friends say they had a guy on CPIC because he was a known associate of a mafia don. Well, this, this is what the association turned out to be. He was assigned parking stall number 11. This big mafia guy was parking stall 12. Every morning they came in roughly the same time and said hello. That was enough because he was under surveillance to be a known associate. These same guys, do I have time for one little story? These same guys had to do what they call a black bag job. Now, now we do this online. But in the olden days, and I've done one or two of these, sometimes we would be authorized to go in and plant a keystroke recorder on somebody's computer. I did one for a dishonest employee in downtown Calgary, and I, I tapped his computer. Anyway, my friends had to go and do this mafia figure, so they figured out a good way to do it. They said, well, you know what we're going to do? We're going to um, um, send him a letter from the best Italian restaurant in town that invites him and his whole family out for dinner. And the FBI paid for it, right? And I'm sorry, a federal agency paid. So anyway, the, the, um, while they were out dining, these guys said they came to the front door and they opened the front door and they knew that he had some pets. So as my friend said, well, you know, the, uh, the dog came to the door, but you know, he was growling, but nothing that a nice juicy T-bone steak wouldn't help. And so you know, the dog's off there, but the darn cat got out. And so now they have these big burly FBI agents scouring this back lanes of this guy's neighborhood, and finally you hear on the radio, we have the suspect in custody. <laughs> and they bring the cat in, and they got the bug oil plant, and they fix everything the way it was, dogs in, cats in. They said, as they put the cat in, they heard this god-awful yowling and barking, and they said, oh, let's get out of here. So they got out of there. And the next day, this guy's going around telling all his mafia friends, the effing FBI came into my house last night, and they switched my cat. <laughs> There's more like that in the book, buy it.
And if you want to buy, there's no copies here to sign. We don't have them printed yet. The order forms in the back, you all get a 15% discount. It's right on there. Thank you.